Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this webinar. I'm really thrilled to have these esteemed speakers uh, willing to share their work with us. We're going to start with a presentation from Ann Kolonowski and that'll be followed by a presentation from Gloria Gitlin. And I hope you got a chance to read their um, about their work and some of their work which they'll be sharing with us today. And hopefully there will be time for questions at the end. So you can go ahead and um, hover over the chat at the bottom of the screen and that's where you'll type in your questions um, for our speakers. And with that, I'll go ahead and let Anne take over. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, just as background, I'd like people to know that my program of research has centered on developing and testing non-pharmacological interventions like activities for nursing home residents. And so um, what I'm going to share with you tonight are activities that are appropriate for people who are in mid to late stages of dementia, but they can be used in just about any setting. So we know that improving behavioral health in people living with dementia has been a tangled web for a long period of time. Uh, we've known that pharmacological interventions for behavioral symptoms like agitation, um, wandering, et cetera, uh, show little effect and they do carry a risk for adverse events. In a recent systematic review that my colleague and friend and co-presenter tonight uh, wrote, they concluded that non-pharmacological interventions like activities show modest effects, but there are, you know, uh, obviously some methodological issues in some of the studies that they reviewed. But the question is, uh, do we need to wait for a more well-designed trial to deliver person-centered care? And I think we can recommend approaches that have practice-based evidence. And that's what I'm going to share with you tonight. So how did our team break into this tangled web? It's uh, a story as I was sharing with um, Sarah early, uh, earlier that it's, um, you know, a lifetime of work. We began by building a theoretical framework that attempts to explain these behavioral symptoms, the need-driven dementia-compromised behavior model, or NDB for short. And what I think was um, quite novel about our thinking back in 1996 is that we conceptualize these symptoms at, such as agitation or apathy as a form of communication, an expression of an unmet need. And in the uh, NDB model, certain background factors such as cognitive ability, physical function, premorbid personality can put people at risk for these symptoms. While proximal factors can precipitate the symptom in an at risk individual. And these are factors like noise, crowding, pain. So we then worked with two very talented people to derive a non-pharmacological intervention from that framework. Dr. Paul Costa, at the time he was chief of the Laboratory of Cognition and Personality at NIA. And he developed this idea of style of interest. And out of his work, we concluded that activities are going to be interesting when they meet individual needs. And these needs are really an expression of people's personality. We also worked with a recreational therapist, Dr. Lynn Bittner, who designed a whole suite of activities that she called simple pleasures. And these activities were designed based on the um, the idea that you need to match activities 
to functional capacity in order to promote engagement or what they call flow. And for any of you recreational therapists out there, I do want to give a, a shout out to you. I think a recreational therapist is just absolutely an indispensable member of your team when you're thinking about coming up with activities that keep people who are living with dementia engaged. Um, so um, this was our causal model. We put our heads together and um, we hypothesized that when activities are tailored to functional ability and style of interest, that they are going to meet needs that arise uh, from the physical and social environment as well as physiological and need states. And the outcomes um, that we were interested in were not only outcomes related to reducing agitation or these behavioral symptoms, but we also were interested in seeing whether or not we could improve indicators of well-being, outcomes like improved engagement, positive affect, uh, having residents tell us that they were indeed in a better mood. So here are the major assessments that we used for tailoring activities and some websites that I encourage you to take a look at where you can get some of those um, instruments for measuring um, preferences or interest, function, of course, hearing and vision. And then as far as outcomes, um, again, we have uh, some websites here um, where you can access a lot of different um, instruments for measuring behavioral symptoms, but also thinking about positive uh, outcomes such as affect, mood, engagement, where we look at time on task and the level of participation that people um, uh, exhibit. And then if we have time tonight, I do want to talk a little bit about an outcome that we're um, pursuing right now, this idea of affect balance, the ratio of positive to negative affect. And I will say a little more about that later. Um, here's a reference for those of you that would like more information on how to prescribe activities using the results of your assessment of interest and functional capacity. So what do some of these activities look like that uh, we used with residents who were mid to late stages of dementia? Well, here's one, it's called uh, the Look Inside Purse. And we found this to be very engaging, uh, particularly for Older adults who uh, are into rummaging around would fill that purse up with a lot of little trinkets and it would be very um, engaging and distracting for quite uh, some time. Uh, we also had a look inside tackle box for people that like to fish. Hang the laundry. This was uh, very popular with older women. Um, it also promotes um, upper body function. Uh, we, the wandering cart, that was uh, one that got quite a bit of use in the nursing homes. And we would use this for residents, you know, who like, who did wander. Um, it was built so that um, they couldn't get into dangerous places, those PVC pipings were wide enough that they couldn't get into, um, you know, maybe a medication room. And you could put a tray on top of that uh, where you could put snacks so that people could eat while they were, um, you know, walking around and um, hopefully prevent uh, weight loss. And then our all-time favorite was this wheelchair bike. Now, obviously, this isn't something that, you know, is a lot more expensive than the other simple pleasures, but we had Kiwanis clubs and Lions, um, 
organizations that oftentimes um, would contact nursing homes and say, you know, we'd like to help out. Um, this was a great thing. Not only did the residents line up for this activity, but so did the staff. They loved taking this bike outside. And um, on rainy days, uh, we'd clear uh, the corridors and, and use it inside. So we tested our hypothesis that activities tailored to interest and function would reduce symptoms of distress and improve quality of life. And across several studies, that hypothesis was supported, including um, our well-powered randomized clinical trial. And so um, what we've concluded across all of those studies is this. We can't four major conclusions. First of all, as you might guess, any activity is better than nothing for improving both agitation and passivity. Very interestingly, uh, that interest match was important for improving positive outcomes, such as engagement, improving attention, alertness, and when it was when we had a match to both interest and function, that uh, was uh, the type of activity that improved pleasure. That interest match was also important for lasting effects. Not only did the interest match improve positive outcomes during the activity, uh, but they lasted throughout the day. And while we often think that non-pharmacological interventions are relatively free of side effects, and that's pretty much true. We did find when uh, we tried to engage people in activities that were not matched to their interest, um, that they reported um, poor mood. So they're not, uh, they can, it can lead to negative behavioral outcomes when you're not attentive to really tailoring activities. So um, our team also uh, pursued other threads. One is on resistiveness to care. And this was work that was done by uh, my colleague, Rita Jablonski at the University of Alabama. She worked on threat reduction during activities of daily living. And she was primarily concerned with providing oral care. And we found that communication was the key here. Using threat reduction strategies allowed staff to um, engage the resident in a longer period of time uh, delivering oral care. And so we came up with these 10 commandments for communication that are threat reducing, as well as promoting uh, a good exchange, communication exchange. And I'll just call out a couple of them that I think are particularly important. Positioning yourself at the resident's eye level when you're communicating. Um, using a very gentle, calm approach, being very mindful of your nonverbal. Avoiding elder speak, you know, that baby talk. One of my colleagues uh, uh, found that elder speak or baby talk can precipitate resistance to care. And then, of course, not shouting or arguing. That's only going to uh, ramp up the resistiveness. Um, here is um, an additional thread that uh, we uh, also pursued, and that was apathy. And this is work that was done by my colleague, Lauren Massimo at uh, Penn. Apathy um, is a reduction in goal-directed behavior, and it um, has three components that can be affected, initiation, planning, and or motivation. And so for residents who have problems with initiating an activity, what we found has been very um, helpful is this system of least restrictive prompts. We'll start by cueing 
asking someone to join an activity. If that isn't successful, then using cueing and demonstrating what we'd like them to do. And then finally, hand over hand, trying to get the resident or older adult to actually start the activity. For motivation, of course, we know that tailored activities do supply that intrinsic motivation. And so we always use tailored activities. But we also find that, um, that people do find purpose when they are engaged. And so asking people for assistance, like I need your help, taps into that sense of purpose. And we have found that to be a great strategy for um, engaging people who are more apathetic. Ask, and I'm gonna say a little more about that later, but um, that has uh, been quite effective for us. Here's a reference that you might find useful for prescribing activities that engage people who are apathetic or have passivity. And then um, I will say a little bit about affect balance as an outcome. It was another thread of ours. Um, several years ago, we did a longitudinal study of affect in nursing home residents. We um, looked at affect across 12 days. And what we found was there was a tremendous amount of variability in both resident reported positive and negative affect, as well as informant, concurrent, informant rated positive and negative affect. And when we looked at this in more depth, we found that like in the general population, positive and negative affect are only modestly correlated. So if you're feeling, you know, uh, you can have a lot of positive affect, but that doesn't mean, uh, that doesn't say that your negative affect is, uh, is gonna be any less. Um, you can win the lottery, but still uh, find out that uh, your grant was not accepted on the first try. So, you know, you both, it's not, uh, winning the lottery might not be, uh, you know, the answer to uh, your grant not getting scored. Um, we also found that positive affect is independent of cognitive status and, and functional ability, which is unlike negative affect. And so we started to think that we can probably improve positive affect um, a little bit more than negative affect. And also getting back to um, our theoretical framework, uh, not all negative affect is bad. It's a form of communication. And so I think one of the goals of our non-pharmacological interventions, particularly our activities, is that we want to improve positive affect relative to negative affect. And we find that we can do this by engaging people in activities they like, having positive communication techniques, and also preserving their physical function. So what do we do during shelter in place? You know, we're looking at a pandemic winter ahead of us. I think the guiding principle uh, during shelter in place is what Lisa Brown, a psychologist from Palo Alto says, is psychological first aid trying to establish a sense of connection and give people a sense of purpose. And that gets into that technique that we used about asking people to help us, to give them a purpose, help fold clothing, you know, help um, bake uh, uh, cookies or whatever, taking people out for nature walks, playing favorite music, um, the fidget blanket that we've used. Door, in nursing homes, we've done doorway bingo and ball toss. Um, 
I did send you two handouts that have a list of uh, a lot of creative activities that you can try. Um, I also direct your attention to NASCO, a company that does uh, design and, and uh, produce senior activities. Um, they also do that for people who have dementia, so it might be worth your checking out that website. And then finally, you asked that we talk a little bit about policy. And as you know, nursing homes were hit very hard by COVID. And this was the impetus for uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services um, Commission on Safety and Quality in Nursing Homes. Their report just came out in September. How far it will go is probably anyone's guess. But um, they did have 27 recommendations. Two, I think, are very apropos of our discussion this evening, and they're related to visitation policies as well as the work um, ecosystem. Um, I really think we need to view family as essential care partners. Um, they are, are they, they provide a, an enormous amount of psychosocial support to residents in nursing homes and, of course, in the community. And as far as nursing homes go, I think we need to start thinking about them as staff providing testing, um, PPE, so that visitation um, can proceed. Another thing that's very near and dear to my heart is staffing levels, particularly RN staffing levels and training. Um, I don't know how far that will go, but I am encouraged by the fact that the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine have just set up a committee on nursing home quality, and I know they will discuss this, staffing levels that really need to improve, as well as the infrastructure, and um, our reimbursement models. So I think I will end there. That is the web we weave, person-centered care for quality of life. Um, I wanna recognize my team who've been with me over the years and uh, the funding sources that we've had. And so I thank you and I'll take questions after our next speaker. Great, so Sarah, I'll just go. Is that what you want me to do? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. If I can find that. The... Okay, sorry about that. Didn't... There we go, okay. Very good. Well, for us, it's good evening, and I want to thank uh, Sarah for organizing this focused webinar on activity. I think we don't often think of activity as a pill, but I would say that a tailored activity to interests and function, as Anne indicated, is a pill in dementia care. Uh, I, it's always an honor to be on the stage with Anne and uh, and covered a lot of very, very critical points. And I'm going to be illustrating some of those points by focusing specifically on a program called the Tailored Activity Program, uh, TAP. And this program is an evidence-based program that improves quality of life for people living with dementia and their caregivers. And very much like Anne's work, uh, it uses activities that are tailored to both the abilities of the person their best functioning, as well as their interests, uh, and instructs family caregivers in how to use these uh, activities in a daily basis, along with disease education and stress reduction and other kinds of communication strategies uh, for uh, the caregiver. I am a research sociologist by training, and I have worked very closely with occupational therapists and other health and human service professionals, and we developed this program in the home. 
And it was developed primarily with a very close colleague of mine, Dr. Pearsall, who is a chair of occupational therapy in uh, Thomas Jefferson University. I do want to mention my many funding sources. Uh, this uh, TAP program has been tested in a variety of randomized trials through different funders. And I wanted to also uh, let you know that because of the effectiveness of this approach, uh, we uh, were inundated with requests for training in the approach. And so I did develop an online training program and I do receive royalties from that and each of the institutions I have ever been at <laughs> uh, also are subject to fees. So the, before I get into TAP per se, I just wanna say that it was developed initially in the home but we also tested it in different settings and the approach can be used in hospitals and I'm gonna show you some data. I'm gonna share primarily the trials uh, for home use. It's also been tested in adult day services and also uh, we've just started working in residential uh, facilities. And you'll recognize a number of the principles that we use because Anne uh, as well has developed some of these principles. Uh, we're excited that with our online program, which gets to issues of how do you scale these complex but meaningful interventions, and when you have an online program, we now have trained people in nine different countries. They've adapted the program for their particular locale, uh, and uh, they have also shown effectiveness. Before I talk specifically about the tailored activity program, I do want to add to Anne's points about why activity. And the most important reason why we need to do research in this area and we need to include activity uh, in our dementia care program is that it matters to people. It matters to people living with dementia and it matters to family caregivers. And through the data that Anne showed and that I will be showing, you will see that engagement in something that's meaningful is associated with improved quality of life. We also know that boredom and lack of activity contribute to a wide range of behavioral and psychological symptoms. And as Anne explained uh, in several different ways, activity that provides a sense of purpose and it connects people back to their environment. And in many cases, their previous roles and what they valued. And it can be a form of stress relief and anxiety relief. And we're engaged in a, uh, some pilot work to test or evaluate, I should say, the physiological benefits of, um, of activity. And unfortunately, some of this research has been disrupted because of COVID. And also we have a conceptual basis for why activity is effective. And Anne shared one conceptual model and I'm going to share another. But I, I wanna show you from some data, how the surveys of different caregivers, how activity is top on their list as to what is an unmet need. And this is data from 303 families living in the Baltimore area that were part of Hopkins uh, Mind uh, trial and in having assessors go in the home, evaluate the home, you can see that 51% of individuals and caregivers identified the lack of having meaningful activities as a primary unmet need. Here is data from 116 caregivers who participated in another type of program called COPE that I developed uh, with uh, Kathy Pearsall and has been tested in Connecticut with Rick Fortinsky's group. And you can see here that caregivers identify what they want to work on with an occupational therapist and a nurse and learn new strategies. And you can see, of course, that every caregiver has a whole slew of different kinds of behavioral symptoms they want to work on and uh, functional challenges that they're managing. And 35% want to work on providing meaningful activities. And another slice of the dice, these are again 348 challenges that caregivers identified and 31% were about engaging the person that they lived with 
in, uh, in an activity. And here again, the same group, but now we're looking at uh, activity engagement as a uh, big unmet need by living status, uh, either together or apart. And you can see it's a concern for people who live apart from the person with dementia, 25% of the 116 caregivers, but close to 41% or close to the majority of those who live with a person living with dementia, activity is just huge. Uh, and in our uh, work with families right now and in interviewing families, uh, we, the number one complaint we hear, what am I supposed to do now? The adult day center is closed. The senior center is closed. I have no idea what to do with my mom who's in the moderate stage of dementia. So activity is really important, uh, particularly when uh, someone, a family caregiver is living with a person with dementia. And then activity can alleviate stressful situations. And you'll see this in some of the data. But here the challenge was, uh, you know, my mom gets really distressed when we take her in the car for adult day. And a solution, listening to her favorite music or looking at familiar photos distracts and relaxes her and gets her ready for the day. So we see over and over again that activities are uh, stress reducing. And again, I'm going to show you some data to that effect. And then finally, <clears throat> before I go on to the specifics of the program, I did want to share another conceptual framework for understanding uh, behavioral and psychological symptoms and how activity and engagement in um, meaningful activity uh, can reduce neuropsychiatric symptoms. And so this is a very busy chart developed by my colleagues, uh, Dr. Kales and Dr. Lyketsos as part of an NIMH and NIA uh, workshop. And here we view behaviors as really a combination of different uh, brain changes, if you will, due to a degenerative uh, a disease process that disrupts circuitry in the brain. And there's a direct effect then on behaviors. And this might be the route for drug discovery. But in fact, behaviors often occur over and above that, or in addition to, or uh, because of the fact that changes in the brain make the person more vulnerable to their environment. And here, when we say environment, we're looking at person-based factors, such as uh, whether they have an underlying um, infection or pain or an unmet need. Uh, they have other kinds of, of issues of poor sleep, of boredom, or caregiver factors, communication patterns, the distress of the caregiver, unrealistic expectations, not realizing that the person living with dementia has executive dysfunction and uh, cannot understand how to initiate an activity. Uh, and then environmental, physical environmental factors, such as overstimulation and understimulation. And similar to the way Anne expressed it, the Tailored Activity Program, or TAP, is designed to minimize these stressors and get the just right fit between the person and the environment to reduce neuropsychiatric symptoms as one of its outcomes. And also, as you'll see, to support uh, best functioning. So having said that, let's, uh, let me get into a more detail as to how TAP works. Uh, it was initially tested up to eight sessions. When we placed TAP in the home, when we placed TAP in the hospital, these eight one hour sessions, one and a half hour sessions, uh, you know, you, you, that doesn't work in a hospital setting, right? It doesn't work in an adult day setting. Uh, and so in those settings, what we find is that we shorten the number of sessions, excuse me, we shorten the duration of sessions, but we increase the number of sessions. So in the hospital, we had sessions lasting anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes, and we might have 11 or 12 sessions over a very short period of time of hospitalization. And we tested this, I should say, in the hospital in an inpatient um, floor where people were hospitalized for psyche, neuropsychiatric disorders, primarily from dementia, and they would stay in the hospital for about two weeks. We tested it and we do consider the best approach to implementing TAP to be delivered by an occupational therapist because they're uniquely trained to look at the functional consequences of cognitive changes and bring in environmental factors and 
put that all together to create an activity that's tailored to uh, interests and abilities. But we have since uh, moved uh, from a data using our best data to a place where we now can train other health providers and we uh, we uh, encourage them to have a consultant with an occupational therapist because they are very much trained to, um, uh, to deconstruct activities uh, and to uh, set up activities, again, based on combinations of function and uh, interests and the environment. TAP has three phases, an assessment phase that's very critical, and I'm going to explain that in a moment. Then based on the assessment, there is a creation of what we find to be really important is to create three different activities that are then customized to what the person can do, not just what they can't do, uh, and then training or instructing the family caregiver, or it could be a volunteer, or it could be a recreational therapist, or it could be a, um, a certified nurse assistant, uh, how to use the activities in every uh, day uh, life. Uh, and then we also work with whoever is using the activities, how to think through that activity and prepare for future declines, uh, how to um, minimize, to change the activity so that there may be less steps and complexity with uh, cognitive decline, and how to use some of the basic strategies of simplification to other care strategies. So those are the basic phases, and it doesn't matter what setting you're in, uh, that's how we proceed, but the dosage and intensity can vary, and who delivers it can vary. I want to talk a little bit about the assessment because it's very important, and the assessment actually serves as an intervention in itself. So first is we do an assessment of the person living with dementia, and that is looking at previous roles, their past and current interests, and their abilities. Uh, looking at sensorial changes, their physical function, their executive function, their mobility, their behavioral symptoms. We use assessments that not only look at cognitive decline, but also enable us to identify what the person can still do. And then we assess the caregiver. And again, this could be uh, the, the volunteer, whoever's going to be using the activities, the home health aid or the caregiver. But what is their readiness? What is their understanding of dementia and uh, of the role of activity? What is their stress level? How do they communicate? What are their daily routines? Are they employed? Can they use activities? Uh, do they enjoy being with the person or they uh, don't really want to be a caregiver? And what other kind of roles do they have? All of this is very influential in terms of the activities that are chosen uh, because when you're in the home in particular, that activity has to resonate with the caregiver as much as it does with the person living with dementia. I have many examples where we have a wonderful activity that the person with dementia is totally enjoying and totally engaged and in love with, but the caregiver refuses to use it because it is too simple in their minds as to what their mother or their husband used to be able to do, and they can't look at them using a more simplified activity. So in the home in particular, assessing the caregiver is very important. And then, of course, the physical environment. What about the lighting and the seating uh, in order to carry out the activity? How accessible are objects? And depending on what the sensory and, and uh, cognitive abilities of the person, do objects have to be in their visual field? How many people are in the environment? We've introduced activities in very crowded small apartments where you have grandchildren uh, playing and uh, uh, happy noises, but it's very distracting to the person with dementia or the television and the radio are on and no one understands why that's so agitating to the person with dementia. And then from all of that, putting that together to create activity prescriptions that reflect, you know, the different levels of cognitive ability and this um, just gives you a breakdown in terms of the, you know, early stage, moderate and severe. So at an early stage, we may have an activity that's very goal oriented and multi step. If the person can sequence an activity, I mean, just think of anything that you do during the day, even I mean, just getting up in the morning and brushing your teeth. It's a multi step uh, cognitive and behavioral process. Uh, and so we consider all of these things and we then report to the caregiver, to the family, 
the assessment results. So for example, if a person is at fall risk, you're certainly not going to provide an activity that's going to put the person at uh, heighten their fall risk, like a walk in a garden unattended, or perhaps standing to uh, make a salad or things like that. So all of this goes into um, activity identification and tailoring. And then we instruct the caregiver and caregivers uh, really need to learn a lot. And in this process, you find that caregivers have a very, they're, they're, it's very challenging to understand dementia. Uh, and so caregivers have to learn what the person can do. They get confused. After all, mom under, called me by my name in the morning and in the afternoon, she says she forgot my name and she's just doing to spite that to spite me. Those are very common reactions and it's very hard. So caregivers learn what the person can do and what they can't do. And they are, practice the activity and they also learn how to manage their own stress and how to make adjustments. Uh, and then, as I said, the generalization phase. So here's a concrete example. This is Mrs. H. She, um, her daughter indicates that she is restless, asking questions over and over again. Um, she was a pastor. She was a mother of nine, and her main role was as a mother, uh, and she is used to helping. So you already can have in your mind some activities that you might want to consider. Now we use, I'm not going to, I don't have time to get into the clinical assessments, but let me just say an Allen cognitive level of 3.2 means that a Mrs. Miss H is able to do manual actions. And by the way, look at her mini mental status. This is what the doctor knows. But what the doctor doesn't know is that she has very good eye-hand coordination, that she does well with repetitive actions, that she can distinguish size, shape, and color, that she understands the meaning of uh, certain objects, particularly those that are familiar to her. Her home was pretty safe and it wasn't cluttered and it was quiet. She lived with her daughter and her daughter was very much ready to try anything. Uh, she was willing to try all different activities and to commit the energy. She really wanted quality of life. So what are some of the activities? Well, I think you could guess folding laundry, uh, unfold, unload the dishwasher, but in uh, having a chair to do that because she is a fall risk with the tug score, the um, timed up and go, and listening to gospel music. Now folding laundry, what does the daughter say? I don't generate that much laundry for my mother to have. So we set up a basket, we have the daughter take all these towels and say, this is your mother's laundry. And every morning or when she feels anxious because you have to go in the other room to prepare her meal, you can offer her an opportunity to help you and say, mom, could you please help me fold the laundry? And so these are the things that caregivers learn. Also, Gloria, the daughter, wanted her mom to learn new things and initiate on her own. She didn't realize that her mother could not initiate on her own and that activities had to be geared where her mother was at. She wanted her mother to be able to do the things that she used to do. And so it's all about disease education. The daughter was raised to do household tasks properly. Mom isn't folding the clothing right. She isn't putting the um, dishes away right. Well, that's not, that's not really what we're talking about here. This is an activity to engage and give the mother a sense of purpose. And this is, these are things that caregivers have to be taught. It's stressful giving the caregiver um, stress reduction techniques, very simple, deep breathing. We found really facilitated the use of these activities. And Gloria wanted to give her mom choices. What do you want for breakfast? Eggs? Would you like sunny side up? Would you like cereal? That was way too confusing. She has an MMSC of two. So we had to teach uh, the daughter how to communicate. And this is all through activity. Sometimes I see activity as a um, Trojan horse because as we introduce the activity, we are revealing a lot of things the caregiver and others did not understand about the person, what they can do and what they can't. Now I want to share with you a video because I think it illustrates many of the principles Anne said and that I've said. And this is a woman in Italy and she speaks Italian for any of, if any of you know Italian. And we had trained an occupational therapist in Italy and he introduced the TAP program in his unit. And uh, she lived with her sons who dropped her off in this special care unit 
because she was so agitated and they couldn't take it. So just listen to this. Okay, she's causing quite a disruption. The staff are getting very agitated. Uh, they called my colleague, the OT, immediately. They started physically trying to, rest I don't mean restrain, but to stop her. That got her very agitated. So let me show you what happens when you figure out that she was a homemaker, that she didn't understand the dialect of the staff, and they were talking too, too loud, and uh, she couldn't understand them. And now she, oh, I'm sorry, wait a minute. Let me try it again. I will. Let's see if this works. So giving her a job where they set up a um, bin with uh, hospital garments. And just like Anne said, her purpose was to help the staff fold the clothing. And this was her pill. She did not need her anxiety medication. This was kept in her room. And uh, the bin was kept in her room and would be brought out you can see she's a little distracted, but they want to keep her engaged with others and socialized. And I have to say that the report from my friend is that within uh, within over um, a three month period, they saved thirty thousand dollar uh, dollars in euros in psychiatric medication orders. And so the uh, Jero psychologist ordered tap for all the residents. Um, I'm just going to show you real quick, if that's okay, another uh, Mr. Oh, sorry, Mr. T. Let me try it one more time. And he is in a uh, hospital unit, psychiatric unit, very young, lives with his new wife. He's an architect. He followed all the women around, very, very, very anxious, uh, very agitated. He would follow the nurses, this, he's now following an occupational therapist into a closet and she's trying to keep him calm and say that she's just getting clothing. There's no sound to this. Uh, he would follow the nurses into people's rooms. What would happen? They're trying to attend to somebody in bed who's screaming and he's in the room agitating everybody. And so the nurses started yelling at him. And then there's a conference that we have to restrain him. So he's an architect. He's very anxious. He obviously is having challenges understanding. His speech was very poor. And so the occupational therapist put him in a very quiet activity room, brought out some, got him some graph paper and said, Mr. T, could you help us? We are designing this room for activities for all the patients and you're an architect. Could you please help us think through? And every morning he would do this. And again, uh, he could have a reduction in some of his medications. So I want to share with you in a little bit of time, and I'm going to go really quickly through this, some of the results from our clinical trials. So the first clinical trial, which I'll just call a phase two uh, randomized trial, we found really huge effects with 60 people, reduced behavioral symptoms, reduced functional dependence, improved engagement, and then uh, more time for the caregiver. So you see here that there was a three hour increase in the control group caregivers saying that they had to be doing things for the person with dementia versus a one hour decrease in the group that received TAP. In terms of thinking about hours on duty, we saw, uh, wait one second, we saw a three hour increase in feeling that you are on duty in the control group versus a five hour decrease in the TAP group. In our other trials, we haven't found this huge differences, but we always see that caregivers save anywhere from a half an hour to an hour by using TAP. This is a trial with 30 people by colleagues in Brazil. And again, I won't go through all of this, but just to say that if you compare the blue, that's the TAP group, to the red, that's the control group pre and post, 
For every measure, neuropsychiatric behaviors, number of behaviors, caregiver upset, the control group increases over time, gets worse, and the uh, TAP group uh, declines. Same thing with any way you want to cut quality of life. Person saying it themselves, the, uh, the, rating their own quality of life, the caregiver rating the person's quality of life, the caregivers rating their own quality of life, uh, as well as burden. It all favors the TAP group. This is a randomized trial uh, through the VA in uh, Florida. And we see, again, reductions in the number of behavioral symptoms, a reduction in the frequency and severity of behavioral symptoms. We see that there's less dependence in people who receive TAP. Uh, and we also see that the number of ADLs for which assistance is needed either stays the same or declines where it increases in the control group. Same thing with instrumental activities of daily living. We see these are small changes, admittedly, but they also reflect um, assistance reflects burden on the part of caregivers. So you see the same in our Baltimore trial of 250 study participants. This is under review now. We see caregivers reporting much greater improvement in all of our trials, including the Baltimore trial with 250 people. And this is very interesting. We tracked uh, health-related events. And here you see that in the TAP group, uh, four people died versus seven in the control group. The control group was an attention control group and caregivers got education. We see that there were 17 people living with dementia that were hospitalized in TAP compared to 29 who were hospitalized in the attention control. Three caregivers in TAP were hospitalized compared to 21 caregivers hospitalized in the control group. Eight caregivers scored high on clinical depression in the TAP group compared to 12. And overall, 51 uh, health events occurred in TAP versus 75 in the control group. So it seems to have a health-related uh, um, benefit. I wanted to also say that we asked caregivers to observe that when they did the activity in between sessions, what did they observe? And this is a very crude measure of trying to get at what do they see in terms of interest and pleasure, any anxiety or upset or agitation. And you can see that for the most part, uh, caregivers reported over a number of sessions that when they use the activities between these sessions, uh, great pleasure. There was little, 74% um, indicated no anxiety and 89% indicated no agitation. There's still, that you can see though that there were 5% that indicated that there was upset doing the activity and 3% agitation. So when we do, these are behavioral clinical interventions that are therapeutic and have to be understood that way and monitored. And of course, we train caregivers what to do when you see upset and, and so forth. Wanted to just share with you some data that resonates with what Anne talked about in terms of positive and negative affect. These are observations of people engaged in TAP versus any activity. And I would have the same conclusion that uh, and derived. Any activity is better than nothing. And we see a slight increase in pleasure for those uh, with uh, in the TAP group compared to any. But look at the decrease in negative affect. Anxiety and anger, 29% decrease in the TAP group versus the group that got any activity. So that a tailored activity is really important for addressing negative affect where any activity can give people pleasure. But even here, a positive, um, a tailored activity does even enhance or bolster uh, pleasure. So in summary, uh, in terms of caregivers across our trials, we see more time for self by using tailored activities. These are family caregivers. More improved well-being, improved confidence in using activities as part of a behavioral, as part of a care strategy, reduced behavioral symptoms, reduced physical, in terms of the person with dementia, we see reduced physical dependence, fewer health events, and in most trials, um, an improved quality of life. And here are just some things that the family say. Just doing the activity, a caregiver saying, just doing this activity was stress reduction for me. 
Uh, it was a wonderful program. I feel that we both benefited. I just got a call, got a call a couple months ago from someone in our trial five years ago that called to say, to thank us that she's still using the activities. <laughs> Mom sang along with 50% of the songs and hummed to the others. I was very surprised with mom's level of engagement. Uh, we've continued with this activity at least once a day with great results. So I won't get into this because we're running out of time, but I was going to share what it means to be trained online, but it is uh, six 50-minute online modules with a follow-up discussion. But here's the big question, and this is where we started before this uh, seminar uh, webinar began. What do we do now? We have evidence. How do we integrate TAP and other approaches to tailoring activities, uh, such as the way um, you know, Anne's work as well, into dementia care? How do we scale and assure families that they have access to this program? How do we instruct current and future health professionals in these and other uh, evidence-based programs? We have to change dementia care to include access to these evidence-based programs practice-based learnings, uh, because we really can make life better, and that's what we should be doing. And with that, I'm going to stop. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. And um, we have a few more minutes, and, and these were both really great and very rich presentations. So I, I think Anne is still on, and if people have any questions, I just um, myself want to follow up on, you know, you you both have done such a, a rich amount of work, and and feels like to me, you have a strong, um, you've, you've built a strong evidence base. And yeah, we're, you know, looks like Kate Posine has a similar question. Like, how do we, what are the levers? Like, how do we make these interventions more available to the families that we're working with? You know, is there a low hanging fruit or? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Well, well, can I just say one, uh, I'll start on and then I'll turn it over to you. I mean, for the home, the assessment approach, we boiled it down from two visits to one visit, and that, that can be reimbursed mm. through Medicare Part B. And uh, we know the codes that it's reimbursable, and we can also do one or two sessions after that, and it can be reimbursed in the home. In the hospital, reimbursement was never a problem because this was part of the treatment of the uh, patient, and so they were billed OT uh, and nurse hours and just as they normally would. And uh, it was very effective. But reimbursement in our country, not in other countries, mm -hmm. this is being rolled, TAP is being rolled out in like 70, 80 sites in Australia. They don't mm -hmm. even ask me about cost. They mm -hmm. don't even, not that they're not concerned about cost, but mm -hmm. their motivation is to, to make life better. So I think it depends upon the country and the health system, but I think training a workforce is really critical mm -hmm. and we had to do, you know, put an online program, but I really want this to be part of education uh, within the educate, you know, within a master's degree or wh wherever it would be appropriate, not, you know, and not when you first enter a nursing school, for example, but um, at some point in uh, the trajectory of of education of our health and human service professionals, these programs should be part of their training. So right now, occupational therapists, they learn the Ellen Cognitive, they learn some of the assessment tools, but they don't necessarily learn about dementia or how to prescribe activities. That's right. We're not teaching OT. We're not teaching nursing. We're not teaching. What we're teaching is a protocol that's proven. Mm -hmm. So they know how to do an activity analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, as a matter of fact, when we started in the hospital, the OTs, said to us and the rec ther recreational therapist, we, don't, we do this all the time. Mm. And, we, and so we said, well, wait a minute, do you use an assessment approach? Do you know what the person can do? Do you know what they can't do? So they went along with us and we have amazing testimony from our rec therapists and our OTs in the hospital setting that said it was altering for them. It, it changed their practice. Uh, because they, this is a proven, this is a protocol. It's put together. There's evidence. There's a way to do it. There's a way not to do it. So that, that that's pretty important. Mm -hmm. And is that true for the work that you've done in, in nursing homes? Uh, yes, I was going to say the nursing home is, is um, you know, a different setting that has mm -hmm. a, a completely different um, uh, group of barriers. 
-hmm. I think uh, right now we're finishing up our um, pragmatic trial where we're trying to help staff implement non-pharmacological interventions for behavioral symptoms. And what we're finding is that the administration is key. Mm. They have to have buy-in, mm -hmm. uh, they have to believe in this, and they have to put resources in this area. Uh, if that's not there, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, I also think, you know, the reimbursement models that are used, uh, the uh, staffing issues, long-term care has, uh, you know, a long history of um, not being at the table and getting mm -hmm. the kinds of resources that are needed. So, as I said in my presentation, I am hopeful that this, uh, the National Academies um, might be able to do something they certainly did back in 1987. That's how we got physical restraints taken mm -hmm. off residents in nursing homes. So um, I think that's what it's going to take to change policy around reimbursement, staffing levels. Right now, in um, a CMS regulation for a nursing home, they only require to have an RN, one RN in a facility for eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. The other 16 hours can be covered by an LPN. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, you talk about assessments and, and uh, you know, uh, pointing out issues that need to be addressed, you know, uh, with activities. Um, yeah. And it's an issue. So, so staffing and workforce training and changing policy and getting more resources for this population. We're at time. I could keep you guys for another hour to talk about this and I'm probably not allowed. So thank you so much for sharing your work and for doing this work. I know this is many years and um, you've really been pioneers. So um, I really appreciate your work and thank you for sharing it with us. Okay, well, today. Thank you for having us. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.